Well, good morning, church. Thank you, Lord. He's good this morning, isn't he? Man, worship was so good. So, so good. Well, my name's Pastor Evan, and I'm going to be ministering to you this morning. Pastor Nate is being ministered to in the Deer Woods, so he usually <laughs> takes this time of year um, to really just seek the Lord for the coming year, hear what he has um, to say for us, and I'm so thankful for that, that he values that time with the Lord, but you get me this morning, okay? <laughs> um, really, this, um, I know he's, uh, well, I think he's done with um, the Back to Faith School, but how many of you, that series was just so rich, so good, and I know Mona kind of reviewed it for us on Wednesday, so, so good, and um, you know, those messages are available just right at your fingertips to feed on and um, to let the Lord keep speaking to us on it. This really probably could maybe piggyback um, this series this morning. This is just kind of where the Lord's had me, what I've been feeding on personally in my life. Um, so this morning's title is Grace is Working and I Am Resting. Grace is Working and I Am Resting. Let me... Um, I added some stuff here to my notes, so I'm just going to kind of review a little bit because, like I said, this can kind of um, really piggyback and kind of tag along with um, what Pastor Nate has just been ministering from the Word on faith, and um, we've talked a lot about faith, and I'm just going to say a few things about faith and really how this ties in so much with love. How many of you know faith, what, works by love? So how many of you know our faith isn't going to be in operation or in the operation that it should be if there's no love present? And if we don't know how much God loves us, how good of a father we have. Psalm 23, we read it last week for offering. I've been there a lot this week, but just the good shepherd that we have. When we feed on God's love for us, how many of you know faith just rises up. I don't have to try to work it up, right? When I see how much Jesus has done for me, how much God loved me by sending Jesus to pay a price that I couldn't pay, man, faith just rises up, doesn't it? And really what we see is that faith is just simply trust. And what did um, Pastor Nate share last week? That faith is to do what? To please God. Faith isn't a means to please myself or to get myself stuff, right? Faith is simply to do what? To please God. And why does faith please God? I was asking myself that this week. Lord, why does faith please you? And you know why faith pleases him? Because it's fully trusting in him. How many of you know if, if you have children or you've seen children before and you as a parent... There's nothing greater than when you're trying to help your child or, or even another person. You're trying to help someone, and they fully trust what you're saying. How many of you know, because usually when we're telling our kids something or trying to help them with something, it's because we know a little bit more than they do, right? How many of you know God knows <laughs> a little bit more than we do, doesn't he? And so we, when we put our trust in him, or we could say when we put our faith in him, that pleases him because we're trusting in him. We're trusting him. Not only are we trusting him, we're telling God that the son that you sacrificed for us and everything that he made available for us, I can trust in that. I can have confidence in that. I can receive that as mine. Talk about making much of Jesus. When we take full advantage of everything his body did for us, everything his blood did for us, that pleases God. So just say this this morning, grace is working and I'm resting. So we're going to look here at just really... Um, in order to talk about grace and in order to talk about which is really everything that Jesus did for us, we have to see what he did for us. 
because I can't receive of something if I don't know what that is, right? So 1 John uh, 4.10 tells us this, that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Aren't you thankful that Jesus took our sins? 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. So how many of you know, before Jesus came, there had to be sacrifices made, blood sacrifices made, right? They couldn't just come to God any way they wanted to or freely, But aren't you thankful because of Jesus and the blood and the price that was paid, we can now, Hebrews tells us, come boldly to the throne of grace to receive what we need in time of need. What is all this? This is all grace. (laughs) What Jesus did. 1 John 1 9 says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow, what a promise. Not only did he take our sin, but he cleanses us from all unrighteous ways of thinking. What does that mean? Guilt, condemnation, you're not doing enough, you need to do more, you mess up all the time. All of the stuff that, what do we know the enemy is called? The uh, accuser of the brethren, right? And I um, was actually out on a walk this week, and I just heard this so strong that, you know, the devil is the accuser. That, it's what is described as, the devil is the accuser. But you know what it says? That he comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. So he is an accuser, but he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The way he has access into our life to come and to steal, kill, and destroy is when we let the accuser talk and we take that accusation as truth, it opens us up for him to come, steal, kill, and destroy. So when he tries to come and tell you you're not good enough, when he tries to come and hold your past over your head, all the junk, all the lies, he's a liar. Sometimes it's good for us to just remember that. He's a liar. And you can tell him that. You're a liar. I don't receive those thoughts. Those aren't my thoughts. I'm not taking that thought. Anything that brings... No peace, anything that brings turmoil, anything that brings worry, you don't have to receive that. That is not, immediately it should be like a red light. Eat, 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 not God, not God. He doesn't bring me thoughts of fear. He doesn't bring me thoughts of turmoil. So anytime the accuser is talking and those thoughts or those emotions come up from the thoughts that he's throwing at us, You have the ability to resist those thoughts and to say, that's the accuser. And guess what? I'm not letting you in my mind. I'm not letting you in my life. I'm not letting you in my family. I'm not partnering with those words. Because how many of you know he's trying to access our mind? He can't access my spirit. That's been sealed. He can't access my spirit, but he tries to access through my mind to get things into my heart, to get me to believe it, and then to speak it, so then I start to walk that out. But how many of you know, I have the ability to resist those thoughts. And we're going to look here, but Jesus, before he left his disciples, he said, my peace I leave with you. Well, what's he called? The prince of peace. So if thoughts are coming, if feelings are coming, if, if emotions are coming that are not full of peace, I know I'm listening to the wrong word. And I have the ability to change it in a moment. Um, 1 Peter 3.18 says this, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Aren't you thankful that Jesus brought us to God? Amen. 
Hebrews 10, 10 through 14 says, and that And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus, Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Well, what does Ephesians tell us? That he's done what? He's seated us next to him in heavenly places. You're in a seated position. Guess what that is? You're, you're sitting down right now. You're in a place of what? Rest. A seated position is a place of rest. I don't see many of you up toiling, working, trying to do stuff, right? You can rest in the finished work of Jesus and know that you're seated far above. You're not level with the enemy. It's not an even playing field. He's under your feet. You've been seated far above. Ephesians 1, 7 through 8 tells us this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Now, this is the awesome thing about God. He doesn't just give you barely enough or just go, here's just a little bit. Here's just a little bit of my blood. Here's just a little bit of my grace. Here's just a little bit of wisdom. Everywhere you see God's grace and manifestation toward mankind is super abundantly, more than enough, overflowing. And we've we've said this before, but the enemy wants to get you constricted. Small-minded, small thinking that God's not providing, or if he is, it's just barely enough to get me by today. Wrong, wrong, wrong. More than enough. Jesus was more than enough. Jesus didn't just skirt on in and barely get by. It says that they didn't even take his life from him. He gave it up. So what is God's grace? God's grace is his undeserved favor and kindness. It's a gift that can't be earned or worked for. And it's offered through the sacrifice of Jesus. Grace is described as the loving and gracious character of God and is used to describe the forgiveness of sins, salvation, and the transformation of believers' lives. The word grace is translated from the Greek word charis and the Hebrew word chen and means favor, acceptance, loving kindness, and goodwill. So how many of you know God's grace toward you means you're accepted? Say that this morning. I'm accepted. His grace toward you means that his loving kindness is toward you. Now, if we were to all close our eyes and think of God and think of what he looks like when he looks at us, what do you see? It's important. If you've ever done this, truly, (laughs) even in your mistakes and your mess ups, when you close your eyes, how do you see God viewing you? And you know, in those moments of our mess ups, in those moments of mistakes, in the moments when the enemy wants to come and beat you over the head, what we believe that God believes about us is so important. Because if I don't believe what God is believing about me, I will not come to the throne of grace to receive what he's trying to give me. I will stay out of that place. I will stay out of the help. I'll stay out of what I need. So Jesus came And um, let's look at this, John 14, 27. We mentioned this a moment ago, but it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. 
So he was speaking here. He had to go away, and he was sending the gift of the Holy Spirit, another gift to us. Aren't you thankful? We have so much. God's given us so, so much, everything we need to be more than a conqueror in life. So we see he's given us grace. We see here he's given us the Holy Spirit because he couldn't be everywhere at one time. But how many of you know the Holy Spirit can be? And he is peace. He is the spirit of peace. That means when he says something, it's in a spirit of peace. It's not turmoil. It's not chaos. How many of you know we're to be led of the spirit, which we could also say we're to be led of peace? So if you're making decisions, if you're making things from a place of anxiousness, pressure, turmoil, we need to stop. Did you know there's no decision that is too rushed for you to stop and hear what the Holy Spirit's saying to you? Holy Spirit, what are you saying in this moment? If I'm feeling anxious, if I, my heart rate's going up, if I'm feeling frustrated, if I'm all of these things, I can stop because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of me, which means that spirit of peace is there. And you know what his job is that he's 100% good at and never falls short of? He says what the Father is saying. He reminds us of what God has said in his word. So the Holy Spirit is going to bring you a word. And with that word is peace. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 says this. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How many of you know he says we can come to him and we can give him all of our burdens, all of our cares? 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us that, that we can cast the whole of our care onto him because he cares for us. So what do we see here? Jesus, when he's speaking, he's, he's beginning a new time and a new era. Because how many of you know, the Jewish people, they were under the law, weren't they? And the law was given to show what? To show mankind that we needed a savior. Because in our own, we couldn't do enough good. We couldn't follow the law perfectly enough. But how many of you know Jesus fulfilled that law? So when Jesus came, he is basically telling them, hey, it's a new era here. Because this would have been different for them to hear this. That, that wait, I come to you, all who are weary? Because I thought I had to do stuff to earn. And they did, didn't they? But how many of you know Jesus was coming to say, hey, something new is beginning because I showed up on planet Earth, there's a new way we're going to operate. So how many of you know, for the time that Jesus was talking about, for this time to begin, for something to begin, then what does that mean? An old way has to end. So this morning, I'm here to just tell you that old way of struggling and toiling and working for and trying to earn God's favor, God's grace, God's goodness is over. Because Jesus has come and made a new way. So the old time where I carried everything, where I had to labor for everything, where everything was heavy and burdensome, where I had to earn it, is no more. And how many of you know we can't operate in this new way if we're still holding on to the old way? Where I'm still trying to carry everything. And I know for some of us, more than others, we tend to want to show our care <laughs> in various ways, right? But how many of you know there is a godly care for people? There's a godly care for our families. There's a godly care for our spouses and our children, but it's not to be from the place of everything is on me to do the caring. Because how many of you know God gave you your kids? God gave you your relationships. 
And it says that he cares for them even more than you do. So I have to let him work. Psalms 46.10 tells us this, Be still and know that I am God. Great reminder. We, we hear this. He's God, I'm not. <laughs> right? But how many of you know that's a good reminder? And how many of you also know there's something about resting? Because this tells us be still and know that he's God. There's something about being quiet, being restful, sitting still to allow God to speak to us and to allow God to reveal himself to us. So when I'm constantly striving and toiling and laboring, to some degree, I do think I am God, even though I may not actually say that. That is really what I'm saying, is that I can do this, God. Like, step aside for a minute, let me handle this. Whether we want to admit it or not, or not. I think it's on me to heal things, to fix things, to provide for my family, to help. And like I said, all of these things we're supposed to be doing as the body of Christ, right? But we're not supposed to be doing it in our own toil, in our own striving. It's supposed to be by grace through faith. How many of you know Pastor Nate talked like this, but like a hose, right? By grace through faith. So faith is that hose that allows the grace of God to flow through. So my trust in God is what allows his grace to operate into my life. It's like taking that hose and turning it on. It's been there the whole time. What is it? My faith turns on that hose. It allows that grace straight from God's throne room to flow into my life and into my situations. And how many of you know it's the nature of our flesh to want to work for it? This is what happened back in the garden, wasn't it? When Adam made the Adam and Eve made the mistake of listening to the enemy. And how that happened was he came with questions. He came to undermine God. He came to say, is God really basically who he says he is? He came to question. And when they responded to that, how many of you know from that point on, sin entered? How many of you know they, had, they didn't even know what sweat was? They didn't even know what rain was? They didn't, they didn't have to work anything. What was it? it? Everything they did was through fellowship with God was walking with God, was talking the way God talked, creating the way God created, right? Listening to him, partnered with him. But how many of you know after that is when he told mankind, you're going to strive and you're going to work for it now. And then what did they have to do? In order to produce, the Garden of Eden was producing. And what was God's plan was for that garden to keep expanding, God's kingdom to keep expanding, through partnering with him. But now, mankind had to work for it. They had to now dig. They had to plant. They had to work. And so how many of you know, our flesh, in the flesh, this is where the enemy wants to get us, to strive and to work instead of letting grace work. How many of you know, there's still works of faith. There's still work we have to do. It doesn't mean we just sit and twiddle our thumbs and say, well, God, you got it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying everything that we do is realizing it's by his grace and it's with my full trust in him, with everything, with my finances, with my relationships, with all aspects of life that I'm saying, Lord, I trust in you. And when I trust in him and trust his word, speak his word, declare his word, that grace flows into my life and causes the works that I'm doing to not be toilsome to not be stressful, to be at a place of rest. Do you know you can serve God working really hard in the grace and not be tired? What did Paul say? I work more than you all, but what did he say? I do it by the grace given me. He understood it's not in my works that I do it, it's by grace. Okay, um... Let's look at this, Hebrews 3, 7 through 12. 
It says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. So he's talking about the children of Israel, where your fathers tested me, tried me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of what? Unbelief in departing from the living God. So what do we see here? What made God upset here? Unbelief. The children of Israel, they're complaining. Their effort, their striving. What was it masked under? Unbelief. Simply not trusting God. So not believing him, not believing what he said. So an evil heart is an unbelieving heart. Hebrews 3, 12 through 19, we'll keep reading. It says, um, or actually verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. So how many of you know they heard? They heard. Verse 16 tells us that they heard and they chose to do what? To rebel against. What is rebel? We can look sometimes and go, oh, rebellion. But rebellion is just simply they heard the word and chose. They chose. Knowingly chose. I am not going to obey. I'm not going to humble myself. I'm not going to come under that word. And because of that, They chose themselves to not enter into the promised land through unbelief because they simply said and did not take God at his word. So how many of you know, if you were to ask the children of Israel, what kept you out of the wilderness? We heard so many things. There's giants. What did the the children of Israel or the spies come back and say? There's giants. There's big walled cities. In other words, there's obstacles. How many of you can look at situations in your life and say, there's giants, there's big walled cities, there's stuff going on. But what did Caleb and Joshua do? They came and silenced the people and told them, no, we're going to believe what God said. And what did it do? It allowed grace to flow to them. Who do you see getting to go into the promised land? Strong and healthy, vibrant You could say it's a representation of the grace of God fully accessing the plan that he had for them. So what kept them out wasn't giants, wasn't strong walls, it wasn't big cities, it was unbelief. Hebrews 4, 1 through 2 says this, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, so this is the new way, right? Right? Let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So what do we see? Not only has, is he saying the gospel has been preached to you, but he actually said back in the wilderness, back in the time of the children of Israel, the gospel was preached to them too. They just chose not to believe it. And how many of you know the Old Testament is types and shadows of what we see in the New Testament? So the blood of Jesus was shed for us. He went to the cross and carried our sins. We have to believe that. We have to believe in the finished work of Jesus. In order for grace to flow, we have to understand God loved us so much that he gave his son that the devil can't hang anything over our head. He can't hold us under unless we allow him through unbelief. If I be- believe to be, or if I begin to believe I'm a horrible person, if I begin to believe I've just messed up or I always mess up or whatever, all the thoughts of the enemy that he 
begins to give you and you begin to believe it. How many of you know grace doesn't flow there? Help doesn't flow there. Because it really is a place of pride saying, I know more. Or I can do more. Or I just got to work harder. I just got to be, how many times, I just got to be a better person. We've been out on, on the streets before ministering to people. And I'll always ask them, well, how do you know you're going to heaven? Well, I've tried to be a really good person. What is it? The enemies convince people that how you get to heaven and what you do determines is determined by your effort. And still, once you're born again, guess what he's still trying to get you to be messed up with? That it's on you. How much you're doing, what you have to do, instead of on what Jesus has done. Okay, let's look. Um, we'll keep reading here in Hebrews 4, 3 through 10. It says, For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Aren't you thankful? For he has spoken in a certain place of the, of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. So in order to enter, we have to leave the old way. In order to enter this new way that Jesus has made available for us, we have to leave the old way. Cease from our work, cease from our labor, cease from our toil. Hebrews 4.11 says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. So how many of you know the labor that we're to do, the work that we're to do, is to labor to enter into rest? That's the work of faith. That's really the, if we, you've heard it said, the fight of faith. You know what the fight of faith is? The fight of faith is to stay in a place of trust and believing God. And what is that place? When I'm fully trusting God and believing that he will do what he said he will do, that is a place of joy and that is a place of rest. So let's look at Exodus here. We'll look at um, this passage of scripture. And we're going to look at what the Israelites and really the type and shadow that Moses was. Really Moses was a, a picture of Jesus and him coming Aren't you thankful? And you know how he brought out the children of Israel? Was awesome. <laughs> if you go back and read this, there wasn't a feeble one among them. He brought them out with provision. He brought them out with much, we're talking millions of people. Guess what? When Jesus died and his blood made a way for you, you received richly everything, everything that God made available. So Exodus 3, will um, start in verse uh, 15. So moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. So this is when... Um, God came to Moses and basically said, hey, you're the guy. You're the guy that I'm choosing. Um, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt, to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites, all the ites, okay? To a land 
flowing with milk and honey. This is a picture of Jesus. This right here is a picture of Jesus. Guess what he didn't say? I'm, I'm sending Moses to you, and you're going to have to do this, do this, do this, do this, and work really, really hard. What did he say? I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt. So guess what? Jesus has brought you up out of the affliction, out of the bondage that the enemy had on mankind. And he brought us to the promised land, to every promise to enjoy. Don't have to strive for it. Don't have to work for it. It's just what I receive by grace through faith. So this is what God told Moses to declare to the people. That sounds like the gospel, doesn't it? Hey, I'm going to come to you, and I'm going to do it. Not because of what you did. No one in here found Jesus. Jesus found you. So out and into, out of toil and labor and into a land that flows with provision, a land where you don't toil and labor, where you can rest. Aren't you thankful? Exodus 4, 29 through 31. So it says, Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together, just like God had told them um, up in the previous verses, um, and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he did the signs in the sights of the people. So the people believed And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. So guess what they had to also do when they heard? They had to believe. And it says that when the people heard what Moses was saying through Aaron, but when he heard what Moses was saying, they believed. And then what happened? They bowed their heads and worshipped God. Exodus 5, 1 through 19, this is a longer passage. It says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, no, nor will I let Israel go. So Pharaoh's saying, Huh? The God who? What God said? He's going to do what? I don't even know of this God. So they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days, journey into the desert, and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men, that they may labor in it, and let them not regard false words." So what do we see here? This is a picture of what the enemy tries to do to us. What does he try to do? Make you work for it. Here, the gospel was preached to him saying, I will, I will. Hey, I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to do it for you. And then Pharaoh comes in and says, "Uh uh-uh. No, you're going to work for it. And as a matter of fact, we're going to make it even harder for you. Um. Let me see what verse I want to. um, Let's go to verse 15. Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why are you dealing thus with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants. And they say to us, Make brick. And indeed, your servants are beaten. But the fault is in your own people. But he said, You are idle. Idle. Therefore, you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Therefore, go now and work, for no straw shall be given you. Yet you shall deliver the quota of bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel saw that they were in trouble after it was said, You shall not reduce any bricks from your daily quota. Let's go to Exodus 6, 1 through 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will let them go. And with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. 
And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my but by my name I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Egypt of Israel, um, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. So what you're going to see in this passage is everything God's saying, I have, I will, I have, I remembered. In other words, what's he saying? I got it. I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people. I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. Perfect picture of what Jesus has done. He's brought, it says here, that he brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Jesus has brought you out from under the burden of having to earn your salvation, having to earn grace. How many of you know you didn't earn grace? Grace is a gift given to you. God's loving kindness, his favor, his blessings, all provision isn't anything you worked up because you were good enough. You received it when you received Jesus. So God was delivering the children of Israel out of an undoable workload. They couldn't keep up or produce enough. And how many of you know this is what the enemy wants to do to you? He wants to put such heavy loads on you. Whether it's through guilt and condemnation or whether it's through you feeling like you have to do more. We'll go back to Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, where he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The enemy's is heavy, but his is light. And you know why it's light? Because he said, I will. The enemy wants to tell you, you got to do it. Have you ever noticed how the enemy really always is trying to get you to focus on you? It's always a focus on you. So it's either you always mess up or how many of you know, even when, say, like, you start doing Bible reading, you feel like you're making progress, you're doing good. And guess what the enemy wants to come then and even do? You're not doing enough. No, you're not doing good enough. No, you messed up back then. You should have been doing this, 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 and this. And everything is to get it pointed onto you. And what you have to do instead of what Jesus has done for you that you can just receive. How many of you know his grace supplies what we need? All we have to do is just take it and receive it. When Jesus died on the cross, the heavenly supply for all of our needs has been released. The blood of Jesus made a way and made a supply. So, you know, how I, how I view is so important. Am I supply-minded? Or am I, when I wake up, am I thinking, I have to provide, I got to do this, I got to run and do this, I got to, I got to, or... If I'm grace-minded, if I'm aware of everything that Jesus has done, I wake up in the morning and say, Lord, you've given me all grace. You will do this for me. You will do this for my family. You've already provided everything for me. I just simply receive the wisdom to parent my children this morning. I receive the grace to provide for my family. I receive, what is it? It's not saying, like I said, that you just sit there. There is a work to do. But how many of you know it's, it's a different mindset and it's not a heavy thing when I'm coming under his flow? Amen. 
So am I demand-minded? How many of you know there's a, oftentimes a lot of demands on us as, as parents, as coworkers, as bosses, as whatever in life, and the, the demand wants to be there to demand stuff of you. Am I demand-minded or am I supply-minded? So this is what Paul said. He was supply-minded. Colossians 1.29, to this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Aren't you thankful that you can labor and you can work, but it is with him working in you and through you? So labor or working hard in the grace that God's given you, in the grace that God's given you to be a spouse, in the grace that God's given you to be a parent. And you know what? In all of these areas of life, when I realize that the grace given to me is there and all I have to do is just tap it and receive it, it's such a freeing place to just release and let go cares and worries and stuff and trying to do it in my own strength and make things happen and instead just letting God do it. You know those trust falls? I thought of this uh, the other day. With yourself, sometimes it can be easy to say, oh yeah, I I trust God, you know, right? And it's like you can think of yourself as if I were to fall off this stage but called a few people up here to catch me, right? I would have to put trust in them in order for me to fall backwards, that they're going to catch me. And you know what? This is what we do with God. We stand at the edge, and we're struggling, and we're striving, and we're trying so hard, and he's just there going, I got you. Just just fall. I got you. Hey, I got you. With our children, you can safely push them over the edge. <laughs> Seriously. With your spouse, with things that are going on. It's like you can picture pushing them off and God's got it. God's got them. And his hands to hold them are better than mine. His hands to hold your marriage are better than yours. His hand to hold your finances and provision in your life, whatever areas of life. It's like you have to picture you, whatever that care is or whatever that person is or whatever that situation is. I did this the other day. Visually pictured myself pushing it off and seeing him catch. That's a freeing place. When you know he cares so much more than I do. Um, 1 Corinthians 15.10 says this, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So Paul worked hard, but he worked hard inside the grace, inside the flow of grace. And you know why that flow of grace was there? Because he put faith, he put faith and trust in God that what he would do, what he said, he would do it. And that, in order for Paul to say this, was because he remembers who he was. You'll hear him over and over talk about Paul, an apostle by the will of God, by the will of God. He had to say that over himself because you better believe that the enemy came to say, you know who you were, what you did, trying to hold his past over him. But he was aware of the love of God for him, which caused his faith to work, which caused the trust to go up and allow that hose or that flow of grace to operate in his life. So um, let's see. I want us uh, just a few more minutes here. And I want us to see this is just where the Lord's had me, but Jesus as our good shepherd. Jesus as our good shepherd. And you know, it's not just in Psalms 23 that that Jesus is referenced as our good shepherd. It's all over the place. And the reason why he uses that analogy is because how many of you know, if if you look at sheep and you look at, I haven't studied it out, but I do want to do that. But if you look at sheep, how many of you know a flock of sheep, when we, um, my parents lived in 
England for a while, when we visited them, they, there was little flocks of sheep around. And you could tell they were just, they were really cute. But we were talking about it one day when we were driving around, and I was like, man, how the sheep look really is a result of the shepherd. So if I look at a sheepfold and I'm like, oh my gosh, wow, they need some help, right? I'm not going to go to the sheep and be like, what is y'all's problem, right? Who, who do people look to? They look to the shepherd. But you know what is that sheep's job? That sheep's job is not to go off on their own. That sheep's job is to stay underneath the care, the protection, the love, the feeding of the shepherd, Well, Jesus is our good shepherd, and he takes care of us. And you know what? If we don't look good, guess who that represents? If we're all mangy and wore out and tired, it's because we need to really, in a sense, give way, humble ourselves, and come underneath his care, his grace, his way. So Psalms um, 23 says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. So I'm going to stop here, but let's just think about this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It doesn't classify where the want is. Guess what this means? In any area of life, no want. He's your shepherd, so you don't want. I love this. And then the first thing that he tells you to do is not get up, run around, go find grass, do this, do this. Guess what the first thing is, is his good shepherd that he tells you. He makes me lie down in green pastures. So guess what this is? A picture of what, Jesus, what we talked about, the new way. The new way is you don't have to toil and work for it. You just lay down in green pastures. Why? Because my shepherd has it. He leads me beside still waters. What is that? A place of peace. He restores my soul. This is all in rest that this happens. Because the first thing that he talks about is he makes you lie down there. And when he makes you lie down, these are the promises that you have when you're resting in him. There's peace. He restores your soul. He leads you in the path of righteousness for his namesake. And then I just thought this was interesting. It says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. How many of you have ever walked through things that God never intended you to walk in? It doesn't say that he brought you to the valley of the shadow of death. Everywhere else is telling you what he did. This is saying, I walked. (laughs) I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. But isn't it awesome to see, even though we mess up, even though we go off course sometimes, even though we do things, what does it say? I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You can go astray. And guess what? He's still there. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. So here we see it again, not just barely getting by. Your cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So this is a promise to us. And then let's go here, Ephesians 2, 6 through 7. It says this, that he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So what do we see in the book of Ephesians? The same type of um, thing that we see in Psalms 23 that before it goes into talking about how you need to walk, at, you know, Paul's talking to the Ephesian church, and before he tells them what to do, before he, t- he talks to them about the armor, before he talks to them about fighting the good fight, this is what he tells them, that you've been seated. 
In other words, just like what Psalms 23 said. He makes you lie down. Guess what? You've been seated with Christ in heavenly places. So before you start walking, before you start doing, how well you walk is going to be reflective of how well you sit. If I'm seated with him in heavenly places far above, it's a place of rest. It's a place of victory. When I'm praying, I'm not praying from a down and under heavy spot. I have to remember I'm seated with him, next to him in heavenly places, far above all principality, all powers, all rulers of darkness. It's a high place. It's not a down and under place. So I pray from victory. I'm seated with Christ. And Jesus finished the work for me. So how many of you, all of you are seated? I'm the only one in here. I guess it's not seated. But guess what? Guess what you had to do with that chair? How many of you, before you sat down today, thought, I hope this chair holds me? I don't see any hands. You know why? Because you trusted that the chair would do what the chair is supposed to do. Well, guess what? The blood of Jesus... Jesus sacrificed what he made available to you, did what it was supposed to do. Guess what I have to do? Sit down and put trust and faith that his grace, his ability, everything that Jesus purchased for me is working for me. And be confident in it. That brings peace and that brings rest. So say this, grace is working, working. and I am resting. So the promised land for the believer today is rest. It is a place of rest. You know what he told them? That you're going to go to a place that vineyards you didn't plant, houses you didn't build, and he's talking to them about remember, remember who did it for you. And you know, everything that we enjoy in life, everything that God's given us isn't from what we've done to get it. It's because he's provided it for us. So we just have to let go and we have to rest. Um, I just thought this was interesting. Um, I heard this stat and how many of you know lions are awesome animals? (laughs) They're really cool. But um, it said that a lion pretty much like out in the wild, not in a zoo, but out in the wild when they're doing their thing, they pretty much are always living on stress because they're always thinking of having to provide for themselves. They're always out hunting. They're always out working. And it says this, that um, lions in the wild have adrenal glands, which, you know, that's like the stress, I don't know, it releases like your stress hormones and stuff. But their adrenal glands that are are 25 times heavier than lions that are at a zoo or in captivity. 25 times heavier, the ones that are in the wild. Because it's where the stress hormones are released, so they're stressed all the time. And it said that lions live under intense stress, and this is why they live shorter lives. So how many of you know living a stressful life all the time is not God's best for you? And then this um, other stat said, how many of you have ever seen a turtle or a tortoise? It says that their lifespan is 100 years. And how many of you know tortoises are not stressed out? (laughs) Except maybe when we pick them up to do our turtle race, they get a little stressed. But generally speaking, they are not stressed out creatures. They take their time. They eat right? They're kind of slower. I'm not saying as Christians we should be turtles, but I'm saying that they're, they're in a place of rest. They're, they're not running around crazy. They're in a place of peace, and this is God's desire for us. So 1 Peter 5, 8 says, um, 5, 7 through 8 says this, casting all your care upon him, and um, we can come play if you don't care, team. 1 Peter 5, 7 through 8, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
So isn't it interesting that in this passage of scripture, it talks about casting your care on him because he cares for you. And then right after that, it says, because, be sober and be vigilant, because your adversary walks around trying to destroy you. So I think there's something about casting our care, being in a place of peace, taking the Lord's yoke, which is light, it's not heavy, having our full trust in him, that causes the enemy not to have access to us. Because it, ta- it shows that he's, he's looking. So you know what that tells me? He's looking around for people who are full of care. Who are anxious. And how many of you know, you can, you can, I can see it in my own life when I'm full of care. You don't act normal. <laughs> right? I mean, look at animals in the wild. When they're stressed and they're full of care and, and stuff's going on, how many of you know they're very easy to pick out? Because they're not in a place of trust. So casting our care upon him because he cares for you. Isn't it awesome to know that we can give him every care and nothing that we give him is he going, oh gosh, that's too much. Or, oh man, you just gave that to me five minutes ago. But he takes it and he cares for us. So we just have to let it go into God's hands. Um, Let's just stand this morning. And you know what's interesting in the life of Jesus that you see um, on, he was on the earth for 33 years, but only his minis- the ministry portion of his life was for three years. And you, Jesus accomplished everything. Everything in that time span of him being on earth. And he lived 33 years. But you know what's amazing about Jesus is he was never stressed he was never in a hurry. He was never like, I have so much to do. I got to What did he do? He lived in a place of peace because, and he lived in a place of peace with access to all grace, everything that God had made available to him. And he accessed that because of his trust in his loving father, because he knew how much he was loved by God. And so I wanted us to just close our eyes this morning. And I just um, saw this. We'll just take the next just couple minutes here. But I really felt this as I was just praying over this service that specifically there's people um, in here who the enemy's just been whomping on you. I don't know a better way to say it. But just over just it's a specific area that he's um, painted just doom and gloom. There's been heaviness, there's been stress, there may even be symptoms and things in your body that have shown up due to um, the care of stuff, of you striving and trying to earn God's love, trying to earn God's favor, trying to make things happen maybe for your kids or your family and you've been in the place of being the caretaker and feeling the pressure of the one who's got to do it all. And so I just saw this this morning that There is an act of faith. There is an act of faith. And that act of faith that I saw you participating in this morning is coming to the altar and just giving that to him. And I'm, I've shared it before, but I'm a visual person. So just like I said, picturing pushing someone or a situation off of a cliff and seeing that God's got it. But something visual that you have to do and your walk up here, your walk up to the altar is you telling the Lord, you have it. You have it. And then when you get up here, you just talk to the Lord and you give that care over to him. And I always picture it like a, um, I've done it two ways, where you put whatever that is, the person, it could be multiple situations, it could be um, whatever, but you put that in, in your hand and you lift it up and you see God taking it. You know, there's another example of pushing whatever that is off the cliff. Another one that I've done before too is just like a fishing 
fishing rod with a line and you hook whatever that is, that person, that care, and you cast it. It says cast your care. You cast it. But then the awesome thing is you cut the line. You don't reel it back in. Like cut it. Cut it and say, God, I'm, I'm casting this. I'm casting the care of all this, the weight of all of this because you're my good shepherd. You care for me. I don't have to carry it. And you can just cut it. And so all eyes closed, if that's you this morning where you're just saying, yeah, Pastor Evan, it's been heavy the last little bit. It could be a season of heaviness. It could be years. It could be stuff that the enemy just wants to keep bringing up from your past or stuff that you're dealing with. So if that's you this morning, I want you to just take that step of faith with, um, again, between you and the Lord. And this is just your way of saying, Lord, I'm giving it to you. So if that's you, just go ahead and come forward. And we'll just give some time at the altar here. We can dim the lights a little. Thank you, Lord. And this is just between you and God. This is getting free this morning. And I just want to encourage you, if fear of man is keeping you in your seat, have more fear of God. (laughs) Because he's wanting to help you this morning. He's wanting those cares to be gone. And the awesome thing is when, when you're holding on to care when you're holding on whether it's a situation it's a person whatever it is and you're how many of you know like you can have a death grip on it like a how many of you know like if you're if you're holding on to something the enemy wants to get us to hold on to it so tightly but God's like hey like let your grip go let it go I got it and when we're holding it so tightly, he, he's not going to come forcefully take that from us. The only way that that can be removed is if I let the grip of it go and I say, God, you have it. You have it. I don't have the care of this anymore. I release it to you. I'm giving it to you. It may be more than one thing. So let's just... Um, We'll just let the worship team play here. And I just want you to just make an altar before the Lord. If you need to get down on your knees, if you need to, whatever you need to do. And it's just you and the Lord casting that care. And then if you're in the congregation, you can just be stretching forth your hands to those who are forward and thanking the Lord for the work that he's doing. Thank you, Lord. So I just believe, I'm just going to pray over everyone this morning. So Lord, we just thank you for freedom. Freedom over each and every one this morning. We thank you. Your promise to us is that your burden is easy and your yoke is light. So I thank you, Lord. Freedom in Jesus' name. And we do this morning. We cast the whole of our care onto you because you care for us. So just say this with me. I let it go. Say it again. I let it go. And I let the peace of God rule in my heart. You know, you can do that. You can let his peace rule in your heart by thinking on whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's a good report. And so I just want to encourage you just something I do in my own life when, like I said at the very beginning, but when those feelings of anxious thoughts, those um, maybe emotions or things want to come up with that, the Holy Spirit's going to show you 
that you're beginning to take that care, you're beginning, and how do you know you're in care about it? Because you're thinking it over and over and over and over. You're thinking about it, you're thinking about it, you're thinking about it, you're thinking about it. And then it becomes heavier and heavier and heavier. And so when those thoughts want to come, when anxious thoughts want to come or feelings want to come, you can stop and say, nope, I don't receive that pathway. I don't receive that line of thinking. I choose right now to let the peace of God rule in my heart. And you know how the peace of God comes? When you see him taking care of it. And when you know that you're trusting him, is when you see, like, and he's taking it with a smile, and he can work on it so much better than we can. And you know what it does? It's like, it's like that pipe from heaven coming down over your situation. And when you're taking the care of it, you've shut off that grace flow. You've shut off him from being able to help you. But when you release it over to him, it's like you're turning that valve and allowing all grace to flow in that situation over your children, over finances, over relationships. You just turn that switch to let all grace flow when you let go. You just have to let it go. And don't let the enemy take you down that path, heavy and burdensome. It's so much lighter when you know Jesus finished it for me. He's working for me. He's, his word is working in my life. His word is working in my family. His word is working. And what did, what did we learn this whole series? We don't go by what we see. The enemy wants to get you over into care and worry. And when he does that is when you're looking at stuff naturally. What you see with your eyes, what you hear with your ears, he's working in that natural realm to try to get you to operate off of natural But when you get back over into the supernatural and you say, Lord, no, you're working, your word is working, you get the word out, you begin to put your faith and trust in him, the peace of God comes. Amen. Let's just lift our hands, everyone in this room this morning. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. The peace of God is ruling in our hearts and minds. The peace of God is ruling in our children's lives. We thank you. You give us sweet sleep. I just heard that. Some of you haven't slept in a while. But from this moment forward, sweet sleep. Answers. And you've been worrying, which has caused you to not sleep, but you're going to sleep so good, and as you sleep, answers are going to come. Wisdom's going to flow because you've given it over to him. So we thank you, Lord, full of peace. This body of Beyond Church is full of peace as we go and able to minister your peace to others. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you all so much. Just stay in that place of peace. Let it rule your heart and mind. Amen, this week. We love you all. We will see you Wednesday night. Thank you for joining us. We hope you were strengthened and encouraged by the Word of God. If you need prayer, feel free to text us at the number on the screen below. You can also send us an email to info at beyondchurch.org or submit a prayer request form on our website at beyondchurch.org. If you'd like to partner with us in preaching Jesus, you can give securely online through our app or website, or if you prefer to mail your gift, send it to the address shown below. Stay connected with us throughout the week. You can download the app for all of our latest messages and announcements, and be sure and follow us on our socials at Beyond Church. If you've never attended in person, we highly encourage you to plan a visit. You'll never regret prioritizing godly community. We love you and hope to see you soon.